Hello and welcome to Not to Scale, an interview series conducted by Arcoist, where we aim to discuss and learn from the works of prominent professionals in the field of architecture and design. For our current theme, which is the Architect series, we intend to explore the overlap of architecture and technology, and all the possibilities that this overlap offers. And we are off to a great start, as today we are joined by architect Gautam Tiwari. Mr. Tiwari is the co-founder of Smart Visex, uh, the creator of world's first fully immersive virtual reality platform for the building industry, which he co-created along with his partner, Ms. Tithi Tiwari. Mr. Tiwari holds a master's degree in construction management. He is also a lead accredited professional. After gaining global exposure as an architect, he launched Trezzy in 2018. Trezzy is dedicated to solving the issues and the problems faced by multiple stakeholders in the building industry by improving techniques of collaborating, communicating and design visualization. They are doing so by making use of immersive technology and exploiting the power of virtual reality. Stay tuned for this enriching conversation and do watch the entire video. Let us know in the comments below what you think about it. Thanks. So this buzzword has just, uh, uh, you know, started gaining momentum, metaverse and everything. And you've been here for quite a while. Like you've been in this space for quite a while. So uh, it's such a pleasure having this conversation with you. Welcome to Aquas and Not to Scale interview series. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me over. And it's indeed a pleasure. You know, when we started out, uh, it was a quite a tough proposition for us to first explain what immersive technologies are about, what VR is yeah. about. And, uh, you know, after about 15 minutes of setting up a context, we used to go in and then start the discussions and dialogues. But it's such a pleasure to uh, for me to hear that you already have done your research, you have enough material, you know about Metaverse, and we're starting the conversation from there. Right. So uh, developing a pioneer product like this and using this, uh, you know, fairly nascent technology mm -hmm. is what I would say a visionary would do to transform uh, a space and change it uh, for the better. And also to contribute to nation building at a larger scale. Uh, so did you always know that you wanted to play such a pivotal and a big role uh, in the architecture industry and uh, what gave you the confidence to take this plunge? So uh, I'll tell you what, uh, Gunjan, the thing was not about uh, being a visionary. It was just about being a conscious professional and solving the problems that have plagued our industry since very long. You know, So uh, as you mentioned, when we started out, both, both the co-founders, Tithi and I, we've been a part of this uh, uh, industry for uh, nearly 50 years put together, you know, and uh, we, we, were part of uh, Indian and international practices uh, as a part of our professional journey. And uh, we got to experience at a very close quarter some of the pain points that have plagued our industry since forever. And, uh, you know, we are the, one of the largest industries, the architecture, engineering and construction industry, the AEC space. And yet uh, we have always been known to be averse to use of technology to create uh, the issues that uh, face us. Now, what are those issues? Those issues start right at step one when we are, uh, you know, dealing with our designs in a conceptual manner. And then as we go into various phases of project delivery, uh, the, the problems just keep compounding and keep growing in nature. And of course, they get costlier as the, uh, as the project uh, goes towards completion and construction starts to happen. So our endeavor, really, our commitment really to each other and to the profession really was that uh, if we get the opportunity, we should certainly do something that is going to solve the problems that have been around since forever, like I said. Yeah. And uh, when we decided on taking uh, an entrepreneurial plunge, uh, our uh, starting our entrepreneurial journey, uh, one of the key things that was being spoken about as a new emerging technology were immersive technologies, you know. Virtual reality was being spoken about a lot, augmented reality, and all the big companies, uh, be it Facebook or Microsoft, uh, even HTC for that matter, they were coming up with newer devices around uh, in the VR and AR space. So uh, we looked at these technologies. We saw what could be the benefits of use of uh, an immersive sort of an intervention in our profession. 
and uh, we created something meaningful uh, something that could help uh, solve the kind of issues that we have faced uh, using this technology and that was really it you know so more than anything else i mean more than being uh, labeled a visionary i think i would just like to be called a conscious professional because that is what uh, really drove us to creating what we have created rather modest of you to say that because uh, i mean you've been in this space for uh, quite a while and uh, like it is only now that these things are gaining momentum and right. uh, the kind of uh, you know this has become the hot stuff metaverse and uh, people are using it more commonly so you have a masters degree in construction management uh, when did you gain uh, interest in technology and how uh, did you go about pursuing that interest i um, as a student of architecture always uh, had a sort of a bent of mind towards challenging the status quo you know so it was uh, i was not the i was not an easy student to deal with i'm sure i must have given a lot of grief to my professors uh, i feel bad about it today but uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, i always had a sort of a technological bent of mind uh, despite the fact that i i studied architecture and i still remember i was one of the first students in my uh, college to actually pick up autocad and and uh, uh, you know it was my final year project and i actually presented my final year project using uh, autocad was what was it it was on dos back then uh, release 10 it must have been you know so uh, i i did kind of move towards using technology or bringing a technology based intervention in my personal workflow or the kind of work that uh, i i personally liked doing so uh, while i was i was not really a software developer so i can't really say that you know i was a, a big tech geek but i i certainly was not averse to the use of technology as a as a young professional either so uh, when this opportunity came by in terms of bringing about some sort of an intervention that would take us away from the static way of communicating design and by static i mean the studio ways of representing our drawings and those 3d stills and trying to correlate 2d drawings and 3d stills with each other and then trying to communicate our design intent which is a perfect recipe for disaster and despite all of that us architects don't really acknowledge that fact we believe our 3d stills are doing the jobs which they rarely do for our clients you know so when we got this opportunity to kind of create this sort of an intervention uh, we looked around we saw what which way the technology would head not at that particular point in time when we were starting out with this venture in fact we saw what would be the trends that are being forecasted for the next uh, couple of decades you know and immersive technologies were really one of the biggest bet immersive technologies uh, the growing use of cloud uh, building information modeling these were the big trends for our building industry and uh, real time digital collaboration as well and this there was a report by autodesk i think in the year 2016 which identified six key main drivers for as uh, key tech drivers for our industry and immersive tech and real time digital collaboration were two of those six that they had identified so that is what we went towards that is what we identified and that is what we developed so uh, it had nothing to do with me having a technology or a lack of a technology background it is just that i think like i said i was always open to using new uh, methodologies uh, whether it be construction or it be technology and create taking those metal- methodologies into our designs and projects uh, and that is what pushed us towards creating what we have created right so it was the curiosity of technology the curiosity yeah i think that the, like i said right at the beginning challenging the status quo you know there is one way that the world believes in that the world uh, does not like to challenge and we continue using that method uh, despite mm-hmm. the inefficacies despite the challenges around it you know but if you were to take a step back and just question it you know do a bit of a rational thinking in terms of why is it being done this particular way is there a better way of doing this particular thing Uh, i think that that the the questioning mind is what i always had and that is what led us to creating what we have created yeah fantastic uh, so uh, you raised funding at a very early stage in your startup right and that helped you hire uh, skilled resources for your startup were you looking for anything specific in an investor and what advice uh, do you have for young entrepreneurs who are just starting out and they are you know seeking funding so what advice do you have around fundraising the first and foremost uh, fundraising should not be the end all be all for for any young entrepreneur you know so first and foremost it should be about uh, going in and and finding a problem to solve and a real problem to solve if you're solving a real problem chances are you'll get customers you'll get users 
And if if you're getting customers and users, I can assure you, uh, if your product usage is growing and your product is there in the market being used and renewed or whatever be the business model that you eventually work with, uh, yeah. but the chances of you finding an investor is always going to be very high. But that should not, finding an investor should not be the step one. You know, finding a problem, a real problem to solve should be the starting point. And uh, once you are in that situation where you can uh, go and pick and choose the kind of investors you work with, it's a, it's a very tough situation to be in. Uh, some mm -hmm. find it, not all, everyone does, but uh, some certainly, the big companies that we hear about, obviously kind of uh, are in that situation, but not every company finds itself in that uh, a mode of luxury that you are picking and choosing the kind of investors you wish to work with. But if you do certainly are in that position, then I would uh, really advise you to kind of ensure that you bring in investors who, who kind of align with your long-term vision. See, every product, every intervention does not scale up uh, like some of the other big successes, some of the other big successes that we have seen, you know. So there are some which requires patient capital. There are some ventures, some uh, interventions, some innovations that require a vision of 10, 15, 20 years. So make sure that if you've got a, in a long-term play, the kind of investors that you find for yourselves are those kind of investors who are patient with you, who help you nurture your idea, grow, take you to the markets that help you get to the markets at least where your product will sell more or scale faster. Uh, but it is very important to understand what is that big vision and for how long are you in a particular game, you know, because if you are just going after any particular investor, investors are in the in this in the business to make money. You can't fault them for that. So if you're not uh, growing their money fast enough, you'll obviously uh, there'll be a fair amount of grief that you'll be faced with. So, and there are not every venture is like a, a success within an year, two, three, four. Uh, you know, the fastest ones that I've seen grow and become successful are at least seven, eight years, right? So, uh, and I read somewhere uh, a few months back that for anything to mature, for anything to be successful, you at least have to put 10 years in it. So yeah. make sure you find investors who are with you to run that marathon and not, not a sprint. So that, that would be my most sanest advice that I can provide. Barring from the first one, apart from the first one rather, which where I said uh, finding an investor or starting a venture to raise capital cannot be, don't be uh, blindsided or be, be totally enamored by the amount of money the big boys are raising. Find a real problem to solve. And if you find a real problem to solve and you find real customers, investors will surely come to you. Uh, so at what stage uh, did you start approaching the investors? Uh, was it at a concept stage or did you have the MVP ready or did you have your product market fit figured out? No, so our journey was a bit different. So we found our angel investors and a great set of angel investors very early in our journey. Yes, our uh, our POC were ready. In fact, we were earning some money already when we, we went out there. But we were, today we are a product company. That time we were still in a prototype mode and we were a mix of a product. Uh, not Product was not there at all. In fact, it was a very services play. We had created some early proof of concepts using VR and we had some great names using those early POCs and paying us for those POCs as well. So there was no free POC that we got into at that point in time. So as a result of which the first two investors that we met they they bought the founders vision they bought the founders uh, they 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 respected the founders pedigree as well and and uh, stayed with us uh, and they're with us till now you know so uh, i'm talking about year 2016 today it's 2022 at that point in time like i was saying it was just an early prototype that was of selling but it was still a prototype it was not a product so after that capital was raised uh, the commitment to the investors was to kind of productize that journey 100% rather than you know a very services based intervention where if you had a vr solution that you wanted for your business we would have kind of gone and customized things for you and given you as a solution so we created a product that you would start using on your own uh, it was, it became a texas product in the long run and uh, and that's that's what uh, our investors uh, put in the money for and i'm very glad that uh, i know it's it's not been an easy journey it's it's been a tough product to build but we have uh, built it and we've been selling it for uh, almost two and a half years now. Interesting. And uh, so Trezi was a part of uh, Microsoft Accelerator program. Uh, so to yes. what extent did it help the product and your business? Oh, big, big help. Massive. Uh, I think we were a very monolithic sort of a product. So what I, was, what I just answered in the yeah. previous question, that uh, we had some early prototypes, we had good understanding of the technology, 
we were probably one of the front runners uh, there were very few companies who were doing work uh, to the level of quality that uh, we were doing work at but largely very services right but once we went into the microsoft accelerator program uh, the world changed 180 degrees for us i mean we our product thinking grew the product became from a very monolithic sort of a product to a tech saas product uh, it became a product instead of a productized service that we were providing so the entire journey changed and we were, we were lucky enough to uh, be uh, to uh, sit with the uh, microsoft team uh, at the accelerator program for nearly 9 months 10 months and work with the team hands on there were some really really great people great thinkers that we got to interact with and i think uh, i the the i have no words to express the contribution that that association has had for us you know because the product went on to the cloud from a monolithic product became a platform uh, the mm-hmm. spatial computing bit came in uh, the real time uh, uh, editing bit came in uh, collaboration capabilities came into the product our entire journey changed that point onward 2018 on 2018 was a big year for us from a product development perspective and that's really what happened because uh, of us being a part of this particular program perfect uh so over to you pramada for the questions yeah hello sir hi hi pramada uh, so we as an industry are evolving to adapt to uh, the changes that are driven by technology uh, very recently but we have also been fairly hesitant and someone would hesitate to t- take such a deep plunge into the tech world which uh, which you have and it obviously like you said does not matter that you have to be from a tech background or not for you to have that curiosity and drive to disrupt and challenge the status quo but when it comes to skills how did you align your skills to fulfill the needs and demands of your role as a, a co-founder and cpo of trezy that's a great question a uh, brilliant one in fact you know uh, as an architect as the kind of professionals that we grow to be our educational curriculum then the nature of our work we are extremely services based uh, thinkers in our approach you know and a product based thinking is diametrically opposite so i had to uh, not just me both the founders both tithi and i had to kind of really really train ourselves to think product and uh, i must be absolutely honest we failed multiple times all the warnings that were kind of uh, that came our way that you guys are not product people how will you so we were always lucky to have a good technical team uh, so so the technical team kept us going but as founders you are you are the leaders of the organization right so we always had to upskill ourselves constantly plus my role uh, tithi took the chief sales officer role for the for the company while as a managing director she became the sales director as well uh, but i uh, took this uh, role absolutely outside of my comfort zone which is the chief product officer so i really had to upskill myself um, and there were few uh, really great thinkers uh one of them uh, at microsoft scale up was muni uh, and he he was he was just the just the greatest mentor i could i could really ask for and then uh, from from our uh, the 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 first uh, institutional round that we raised uh, we had uh, dr vivek man singh and sunil goel of uh, yarnest vc uh, helping us understand me in particular understand what product philosophy really entails uh, telling me what to read and then there were some colleagues of mine also who came in some great thinkers who uh, came in the role of the uh, you know the product owners in the agile framework of product development and by interacting with them also i got the opportunity to kind of really train my thinking towards the product you know i'll give you a simple example being services uh, oriented thinkers being a construction manager everything is all was always in a quick fix mode for me you know so uh so if there was a defect that comes up on site we send a team we ask them to fix it and come back quickly over a week and fix it and so that before the client or the customer goes back into the facility on a monday morning right yeah. and i had that sort of thinking around bugs and various other things that come into a product as well so i just wanted everything to be fixed overnight and just you know taking a deep breath and understanding that the bug fix is going to be a part of a disciplined uh, sprint planning process so you are going to identify bug fix the bugs as a part of a particular exercise and in the next sprint bug fixes will come about and so it's going to take about 3 to 4 weeks before the current set of uh, a bu- set of bugs that are currently there in this current build are going to get sorted out all that level of thinking i did not have i i actually built that then i did a few certification courses along the way read a fantastic book called uh, and i recommend it to those who would be listening to this uh, uh, the four steps to the uh, epiphany by steve blank 
one of the most brilliant books i have ever read about product development uh, that's become my bible that sits on my uh, uh, on my work desk at office it sits on my uh, head uh, headboard at home so whenever there is some confusion i just kind of pick that book and read uh, steve lang incidentally is is the guru of eric ries who who started the lean startup movement so so some of these things some of the upskilling really was a conscious effort through uh, really uh, i mean we're blessed to have folks like the folks that i mentioned that that came along in our journey at microsoft scale up program through our uh, through the uh, the people that we got connected to through uh, the fundraisers that we did and uh, today i feel very confident that if i was to kind of start building a new product i would start the right way but uh, two years back it was a it was a big uh, struggle that i got into but then the magic happens outside of the comfort zone right and i think that's that's what i am really experiencing now you two as uh, leaders you and uh, mr thi have come so far without a cto right yeah we do not have a cto yet uh, but i think we were but, we, we were not in that state of the journey yet now we are looking actively looking for a cto because the product market fit has been achieved and uh, product renewals are at 85% in fact product usage is growing 30% month on month and we've got some really really exciting plans for the for the uh, so like like uh, gunjun was saying metaverse has become a fancy word now we have been talking metaverse for the past 3 years ourselves you know and the amount of metadata that that our in- industry really comes up uh, uh, you know deals with and how that entire set of metadata comes into our treziverse and how we interact uh, interrogate it interact and edit it and how we call other people in as avatars and interact with our 3d design models so we have been slowly and steadily building and of course there are voice based capabilities inside the treziverse as well so we've been slowly and steadily building our own little metaverse as well you know so uh till that time to to get to where we have to get to we uh, we have had tech leads who kind of uh, helped create what has been created but going beyond uh, now that web3 is going to be big uh, in this particular play uh, nfts may start surfacing as well I do not know but i mean we are still ideating about it we certainly are very actively uh, looking for a cto so in case any good candidate hears this what we are talking as we are talking Uh, yeah. i would invite anybody to kind of come and contact me on my these mm-hmm. girls would have my email id and phone number i'm sure please do write to me awesome so like we said what you're doing is driving a fundamental fundamental transformation in how the industry collaborates and communicates but for it to become mainstream the habits of industry professionals must change do you intend to play that role in habit formation skill development and for the ease of adoption of this technology that's another very smart question i must say i'm really really thrilled to be answering these questions yes you are the industry the industry that we are a part of is extremely inward looking you know any sort of a tech innovation or intervention is first taken pot shots on and if it survives the test of time then people start looking at it uh, seriously enough you know and we have and, and this is not just i mean of course one we are a very tough industry but this is also a reality in any new product every product goes through its valley of death before it comes back to the the slope of enlightenment and all of that right i mean there there is a curve that that typical product development uh, cycle uh, that demonstrates now so so our valley of death was deeper than any others simply because we come from that sort of an industry so so an architect is uh, in india especially is not used to pay to for the softwares that they use they want the world yeah. and i have been i have been a part of that brigade myself so let me not try to act holier than thou uh, i have done that journey myself too uh, so the architect typically wants the and we have we have in our early days we had many such uh, cases where people said give me this product for free uh, use my name if you have to but give me this product for free and we stuck to our guns we said no see as it is the product is so 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 you know it's it's priced at a practically a throwaway price and now the early early part of our journey we were still higher in terms of pricing today so it's like really uh, you know it it's nonsensical the amount of figure so if somebody struggles with the pricing they should not be in the profession to be honest but anyhow on a serious note the uh, uh, the architect typically does not intend to pay for the software they use or at least struggles to pay come to that mindset that i need to pay for the software that i'm using because it's it adds value it uh, increases the efficacy of my workflow it helps me communicate my design intent uh, with my customers better or even digitally choose the products that i currently 
physically select you know we all select products physically trezy allows you to select products digitally now this whole physical selection uh, process is so ineffective and so diverse in terms of you know the stand that we take as architects that we wish to make a better uh, you know ecosystem and it more efficient ecosystem and less wastages but we still go and select products uh, physically so we do mock ups we burn jet fuel fly things around and then we sit back and say no no we are a very very conscious architectural firm uh, but you know what we select our products in a physical manner still uh, mm. but uh, now imagine the amount of so coming back to the question imagine the amount of mindset changes that i have just spoken about in the past 3 yeah. to 4 minutes you know from uh, physical to digital from uh, not buying software to buying software from uh, working in uh, you know physically co-locating to collaborate to digitally collaborating all these are mindset based changes that are going to be required and we very early in our journey uh, coming from the profession uh, sort of established a customer success group that uh, we created making sure that we are in touch with our users practically uh, on a daily basis sometimes uh, irritatingly so but the reality is the reason why we stay in touch with our customers is we don't want them to kind of uh, just you know buy a software and not use it for one year we we keep regularly uh, we have a frequency of meeting our customer at least once a week so that we are ensuring that in case they have not used it we at least tell them that hey listen there's something new that's coming now just imagine the journey we started as a we are only sort of a product then we went into desktops as well to make sure that people spend time inside of prezi not just in vr but outside of vr too and as of last week we have started taking it to the mobile phone as well and uh, with the mobile phone play we are now going to bring in augmented reality based play as well so we were vr desktop mobile phone ar and then there will be mr xr various other forms so this will complete our own metaverse journey you know where all forms of immersive technology play will start coming in so all the more reason for us to kind of keep in- engaging with our customers and ensuring that we keep coaching them keep coaching their teams keep ensuring that how people will how how this sort of an intervention is going to add value in their workflow uh, we we succeed more than we fail sometimes we still fail because uh, people just walk away from the uh, technology at times as well but like i said very early in our conversation renewal rates for us have been upward of 80% touching 85% almost you know so uh, at least so out of 185 customers continue to gain uh, a value and add to the product development value because we work with them we hear their voice we ask them to kind of contribute to product development in terms of what would they now like to see next inside the product so that that sort of a uh, development uh, voice of the customer in the development process was brought in to ensure that whatever you ask premother in terms of how will we ensure that people kind of bring about that sort of a uh, you know sensitivity and sensibility change in their way of being uh, that's being done by continuously engaging creating a structure that that helps us continuously engage with our customers being Amazing. obsessed with the customers right you have to be you have to yeah. be uh, we we discussed this right gunjan you had this question that what would i advise a uh, budding entrepreneur be obsessed with your customers good or bad doesn't matter in fact uh, the worse the feedback better in the long run for you because it will help you sort out what may make your product fail very early uh you were talking about how architects don't uh, like paying for the softwares we don't like paying for a lot of things <laughs> <laughs> and just why we have another issue uh, that is the lack of well paying jobs in the architectural profession especially for beginners uh, how do you think technology can help in generating new and better career opportunities for architecture graduates and what do we need to achieve that you know one of the things that technology will start doing for young architects the fresh entrance into the profession would be that it would help them uh, set up their own practices uh, with far greater degree of success than there used to be uh, in the past you know because if there is a practice that has been around for many years of course there, there is no substitute for experience don't get me wrong but the point is that with with the uh, advent of new tech based interventions uh, one thing that will certainly happen is that a, a young fresh graduate they would be able to kind of use the intelligence that a technology based intervention provides to their benefit to their advantage and deliver value to their projects and their clients to a fairly high degree let me put it that way so uh, one 
I think setting up a new practice by a fresh graduate is going to be that much more uh, easier than it used to be uh, when I graduated in the mid 90s. Uh, and uh, I think uh, from an overall perspective, even an employability perspective, it's going to be better. I uh, suddenly, uh, you know, my peers, a few friends that I know, uh, they, they send me snapshots of resumes and show that people are uh, adding through their resumes that uh, we are we attended a workshop of Prezi and uh, we are we are trained and all of that. So all that uh, shift, uh, tech-based shift that happened back in the times that I was talking about when I was graduating that I am AutoCAD trained used to be a big thing in our times, you know, to write that in the in resumes. Nowadays, for, for uh, uh, folks your age, people talk about Rhino certification programs and various other softwares, right? New parametric-based softwares. And mm -hmm. same ways, immersive interventions, AR, VR are also finding their ways into the resume. So people, the, the fresh uh, entrants into the profession, who would have a wider range of tech exposure, I would think uh, their employability, chances of employability are going to be that much uh, better than somebody who says that, hey, listen, I do not know yet, but I will learn in six months or something like that. Because if I was employing somebody, uh, I would say that, listen, I would, I already have people who are trained in new tech uh, and I do not have the time to wait for you to get trained over the next six months. So whether it's new practice, starting your own new practice, or uh, even from an employability perspective, use of uh, an understanding of emerging tech is certainly going to help. Right. We can now move to rapid fire with Gunshan. Yeah, just before that, I had a question uh, regarding uh, the material selection that we were talking about. Uh, you said that, uh, you know, people still go in and uh, they make sure to get mock-ups done and they burn fuel and all of that. Uh, so there must be like a lot of challenges involved uh, around creating that setup where you can test materials because what happens is you're testing them in artificial light, you're testing them in natural light, how they look, how they appear and at what angle. So like, how are you trying to combat all those challenges? Yeah, so uh, material performance inside of uh, a simulated environment is something that we will eventually want to get to. But material performance, uh, for material performance, there are enough other softwares that exist, uh, right? I mean, whether it's it's the external facade of the kind of heat gain, uh, U factor, various other things that that a glass facade is going to be performing at. Those performance based criteria or calculations are not happening inside of VR. They should eventually, whether it's acoustic or it is heat gain or whatever be the expansion properties of a material. I think technology will eventually reach that level also. But in terms of finished product, and I, I, I was talking about finished products, we are focusing on finished products. It's the chair that you're sitting on, the light fixture above you, the tiling, the, uh, the stone, the marble, the wood, uh, the workstations. So there is a huge physical, I mean, half a trillion dollar, $500 billion worth of finished product segment that, uh, that the world uh, has kind of our world deals with on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. Now, there is a huge amount of physicality involved there. What mm -hmm. is the height? What is the length, breadth, uh, length, breadth, width, height? All those aspects. And then how does a brown laminate look vis-a-vis -vis a white laminate or a veneer vis-a-vis -vis a laminate surface or a marble floor vis-a-vis -vis a, a tiled floor or, uh, or a wooden floor for that matter? Now, that mm -hmm. physicality of material selection, and I'm not talking performance, I'll, I'm being very clear. Uh, so yeah. physicality of product selection is what I'm I'm more interested in kind of supporting currently. One mm -hmm. thing is that uh, the final touch and feel is not going to go away. Final touch and feel is always going to remain. But right now, we do the product selection in a very whimsical manner. And like I said, I have been guilty of that myself. If I If somebody has got 10 options, I would ask them to send me 10 options and then look at just one to select. Now, my yeah. point is that from 10 to 2, that journey we can do using uh, immersive technology. The final two, we'll do our selection the way we have been continuing to do so. But at least do that 10 to 2 while journey using new, uh, new in age interventions. And eventually, I can promise you, in 10 years from now, inside of this virtual environment, inside of this metaverse, we will even bring in product performance. And we will even see how an external glazing uh, performs in a particular environment. Uh, in a particular climate and how a material or an expansion joint performs at a particular time of the day for uh, designers and structural engineers to make a conscious call in terms of what works better for them and what does not. Interesting. Very interesting. 
Uh, so we have the last segment that is the rapid fire segment. Uh, so you need to be very quick with your answers mm -hmm. and um, I, I would need you to be very candid and okay. open about it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so the first question is, um, how do you see the future of the industry shaping in the next five years? Future is immersive. Yeah. Uh, so what is the secret behind all these distinct looks and all your videos and photographs over the internet? I think I, I'm just a very uh, fidgety person. You know, I, I, the constant is not for me. I need, the change is the only constant in my life. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, so what kind of content do you consume? When you say content in terms of reading or just uh, casual content? Casual content. Anything. Device, it could be podcasts. Or, it could be uh, what social I'm, media I'm a, you follow. Yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm a big Spotify fan. I I I listen to a lot of. Uh, I mean, I used to read a lot, but now it's audio books for me. Uh, so I I listen to a lot of podcasts. I listen to a lot of music, and uh, Spotify there is my favorite app. So, uh, what are your top recommendations for podcasts? So I, uh, you know, there is one that I heard. Uh, I think uh, probably six months back, but I heard it very late. It it has been around for a couple of years. Uh, by a neuroscientist. It was just, just about uh, the state of happiness, the, the mental training. I'm a long distance runner. So the, the whole aspect of uh, mental training is very big for me, you know, and when in say 30 or 31 day, 34 days, uh, when you're doing a particular discipline day in, day out, how that becomes a habit. And uh, Ash uh, Ranpar, I think it is, and he talks about the power of habit. That's my favorite recommendation right now because end of the day it is all about being uh, consumed by the habit that contribute to your success you know so whether it is about a sleep pattern or it is about a nutritional pattern or it is a training pattern it, it is all it all resides here so any young entrepreneur they will also need to find the pattern that uh, helps them succeed and uh, that that podcast was fascinating i heard it uh, start to finish and uh, i certainly recommend that right and uh, what is your favorite book to read and what are your recommendations for entrepreneurs to read? So I named one already, but my favorite most book ever is Lord mm -hmm. of the Rings. I have probably read it 11 times. Uh, I started with the 12th time during the lockdown, but I did not finish it. Uh, so Tolkien, I, I really, J.R.R. Tolkien is my favorite author, has always been. So I have read all his books and I even went into... His select works like Unfinished Tales and The Silmarillion, which not many people read, uh, mostly read, mostly the folks read only Hobbit and Lord of the Rings. So uh, that is certainly something that I, I, I'm, uh, that has been a part of, big part of my life, Lord of the Rings. Uh, the other author that I have really enjoyed reading uh, is uh, Alvin Toffler, the futurist. Uh, so back in college, in my first year, one of the first non-course related book that was given to me was Future Shock by, by my roommate who was a finally student at that point in time. And I think that was one of the best training ground that I could get to share a room with a fifth year student as I was a first year, I was a first semester student. And because I got to expand my thinking to a certain extent because of that uh, camaraderie and that bonding that I developed with my room partner back then. Um, the, the, there's some other really fascinating books uh, that I, I recommend. The book that changed my life uh, six years back was a book uh, called Born to Run by Christopher McDougall. And uh, that book uh, just took me to long distance running uh, first time ever. So I really started uh, running when I was 40 uh, already. And mm -hmm. uh, since then, I've done some about, uh, I think, 25 half marathons and some 14, uh, 12 full marathons, including three in Ladakh. Uh, so uh, my journey as uh, towards the power of mind changed with that particular book because running is a lot about power of mind. The habit yeah, uh, wait, podcast that I was talking about. And endurance and persistence. I mean, it must take a lot uh, to carry out that sort of marathon. I think per per like pers Shadha. persistence is key. The word that you selected rightly is persistence because when you're persistent and you are actually doing something day in and day out, just like the power of habit podcast that I was talking about, uh, mm. it, is, uh, it, it is something that really, really... Uh, leads to every success in a many multiple fields you know so endurance comes about because you are uh, persistent if you're not persistent there'll be no endurance and if there is no endurance then tough times are a part of life are a reality of life right and so you have to endure those tough times to kind of get across and come to a point in life in your career 
in your entrepreneurial journey which takes you to success but nothing there is no success overnight success at all yeah. i remember a fascinating uh, uh, quote by i think it was travis kalanick if i'm not wrong uh, and mm-hmm. he said that i i spent some 9 years uh, preparing for my overnight success overnight and success. Uh, and that's uh, that's what it is about you know so there rarely does an overnight success happen because uh, easy come easy go otherwise something that happens too fast success that comes very quickly uh, goes away also fairly quickly true and uh, people say that uh, you know entrepreneurs are consumed by their ventures so how true is it for you and what does work life balance look for you see uh, uh, it's all com- consuming totally there is absolutely no two ways about it uh, if if your venture does not consume you if if you are not crazy about it the the amount of struggle it's very tough entrepreneurship is not easy you know so if it doesn't consume you if you do not see the success beyond the 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 repeated failures that will come into your journey it is very very mm-hmm. tough uh, for you to kind of go beyond those those early jitters or even mid stage jitters or a daily jitters that will come your way uh, mm-hmm. but my 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 genuine my honest and my humble advice to any uh, young entrepreneur is that don't do that at the cost of uh, giving up on certain other passions that may kind of come handy to you you know like my passion mm-hmm. is is running my passion is music so i i ensure that i i still spend about 10 to 11 hours or at work whether i'm working from home or i'm working in office so uh, certainly 10 hour days 11 hours days are what happens on a day to day basis but then the rest of the time that i have i ensure that my life revolves also kind of incorporates my uh, running routine in it so i try to sleep by a particular hour i wake up very early i'm a very early starter i finish mm-hmm. my work uh, running routine by 4:30 uh, starting at 4:30 am by 7 am 7:30 am i'm done with my running routine i'm done with my uh, dropping my kids to school and all that i'm ready to work you know 8:30 onwards i'm back on my desk so uh, you have to find that that one or two other passions that will keep you going because yes being consumed with work is fine but you know you have to maintain your sa- uh, sanity levels as well if you do not do that then uh, no matter how consumed you are with your venture uh, you are not going to go you will not last long enough for it to become a yeah. success you know definitely definitely uh, so uh, what uh, courses do you recommend uh, for fresh graduates right out of architecture college to undertake to make a career in ar uh, and technology i'll come to that sorry one book i left when your last question steve blank's uh, four step to epiphany i had said that earlier also that is a certain recommendation most certainly uh, absolutely a must read for people who want to go towards uh, building products uh, and interventions in our profession yeah sorry uh, your question was what courses i recommend yeah, what courses yeah see i i'm not sure if i can uh, i am uh, worthy enough to kind of answer that one you know i kind of spent a lot of time finding courses uh, in terms of uh, software development practices uh, when i i uh, during the lockdown and as my my chief product officer role was gaining far, uh, a bit more momentum than it had in the early days of the venture so mm-hmm. i i built into my personal thinking from just my personal perspective what has really helped me is understanding of uh, you know agile practices uh, mm. the scrum plannings that go into product development uh, and which allows you to kind of understand disciplines like uh, uh, you know sprint planning grooming and uh, daily stand up practices so the you know i got a scrum certification as well so mm. i my my most of my courses were uh, done through uh, coursera and there are mm. enough software development uh, the basics uh, of software development the advanced principles of software development practices uh the uh, understanding of uh, scrum methodologies those courses helped me a lot but mm. again uh, if i was a fresh architectural graduate today i mean if i was to go back in the uh, into 1996 the courses mm. that helped me at that point in time uh, was of course my masters degree expanded my universe in a big manner so uh, construction management was just coming up at that point in time so uh, going towards uh, construction methodology based innovation courses that will help you uh all see we are doing a tech based intervention in the in the uh, digital side from a design communication collaboration perspective but then there is also a huge big world of construction itself right yeah. there could be courses that uh, will allow you to innovate in terms of uh, the structures how construction happen the 
the heat maps that you need to kind of create for your buildings uh, to be effective the uh, the construction methodology the form work based the concrete setting time there are so many mm -hmm. things that that are out there so maybe a construction methodology innovation based program could be very useful because those interventions are also something that uh, the industry needs uh, because we need to make our whole construction uh, practice also that much more effective not just in terms of the digitization of the process but the actual mm -hmm. construction itself right and uh, what are the top three skills that a fresh graduate must have if they want to take up uh, this technological uh, aspect of aec see, any top um, three skills i i think first and first and foremost being brave is the first thing that i i must absolutely i think i i'll tell everybody see one is uh, about just following the leader the other is being the leader right so be brave mm. be a leader i think that's 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 the first thing that should be there learn to challenge status quo part 2 i mean step 2 absolutely if you are just going to see what is happening pick that up and you know i mean i keep telling my my team members uh, a lot of i use this this quote a lot that you know flogging a dead horse is not going to kind of make the horse stand up and go win a race you know a dead horse is a dead horse so mm. challenge status quo find newer things to do and and then third and most important be persistent you have to stay persistent uh, and you have to kind of stay uh, ensure that if you are starting something you see it to certain degree of completion at least you know losing patience and then saying ki yaar nahi i should have just uh, had a success within the first week or within the first month or within the first year rarely does that happen yeah, i would love to see somebody who's created a huge uh, success within the first year i mean, pick up all the big companies be it amazon be it microsoft be it apple i mean uh, i'm just taking very big names but i mean closer home look at the zomatos or the ptms of the world how much time they have been around how much time those founders hardship those founders would have gone through you know so persistence is key so uh, be brave a uh, challenge status quo and stay persistent those three traits uh, if you can imbibe and uh, internalize i think the chances of you succeeding with whatever be the adversity that comes your way would be fairly high and adversities are going to happen there is yeah. absolutely no two ways there you cannot have a smooth ride uh, if you wish to in anything in life forget being an entrepreneur uh, it's just life life is not smooth life is hard yeah definitely and uh, what uh, is your take on the theory of us living inside a simulation <laughs> Oh well, uh, I have been a big Matrix follower myself. If we kind of go that particular way, we are going to spend a week discussing that. Uh, as a theory, very interesting. As a theory, very interesting. But uh, to each uh, their own. So when you read or you watch uh, Matrix Revolutions and uh, you find it, it's extremely fascinating to think about the possibility of that actually being true. Uh, but it is not. you know so that's the reality of it so we are not in that a simulation we are going to be creating worlds that will be simulated and i think we should be more uh, conscious of that fact and uh, what is in the books and what is in the movies can remain there uh, but we we can make certainly create the metaverses of tomorrow and ensure that we program some of those worlds uh, but fascinating idea i mean amazing to kind of uh, think about it right that we are all programmed we were programmed to come and have this conversation right now so Uh, yeah sounds very interesting right so destiny was in fact written <laughs> was programmed a... yeah not yeah. written yeah programmed yeah yeah so this brings us to the end of this interview it was such an enriching conversation and i feel like we've just gotten started this would definitely require like a part 1 part 2 and part 3 of conversations uh because uh, this is a very intriguing and a vast topic that we have uh that we were discussing here and it's been a pleasure hosting you sir uh so thank you so much for making time for this no thanks for having me over It really uh, you're absolutely right this was a very interesting conversation and i look forward to uh seeing this soon <laughs>